Well, again, welcome everybody. Um, I'm glad we're all here and there can be more coming in and that would be great. Um, and I'll say to the Warwick Oral History Project, we haven't put that much of a moniker on any of these events yet, but that's sort of what this is. And what that's really all about is people who were at events, who participated in events, are going to tell stories about those events. Unlike opening up a book and reading a history about something, we're trying to kind of get in early on some of this stuff. So that's a big piece of why we're here. Um, Basically, I think everybody knows we're here for Warwick Entertainment, which is huge. And we had some fun <laughs> when I say this. Uh, and this is, this is necessary. I was actually going to say earlier to Michael, if when I do my thing, that he just start doing jokes and what have you. And we want to get this whole crew. There's the formal panel. Uh, but you guys are the same. And there is an equality about this whole room, and I, that, that's a heavy word, but I want people here to be able to sound off when, no, it wasn't that way, or, yeah, and we also did this. And that's really key to how this whole thing works. Um, getting back to the topic at hand, it is entertainment. Um, we had some fun things when the, quote, committee, which is a loose group of people uh, who... Uh, we sort of were pretty free about what we were, what we were covering and what, what potential, and the whole thing came to us, sort of discussion as to what entertainment was. And we did get as far as uh, the north end of the Richmond Road and decided that uh, perhaps, and I don't know whether some of you know what I'm talking about. Um, yes, we do. <laughs> okay, that, that's enough. Uh, <coughs> Uh, that that may very well be a topic, and that's the big thing that Ivan's already alluded to, is if you guys have topics and nothing is off the table. So, that's important. Getting back to entertainment, um, it's a huge topic, um, and hopefully we'll all have a sense of how huge it is once we get rolling on this. Um, what we have chosen to do is to basically divide it into two parts. The first part is basically made up of smaller events. Um, possibly annual events for a few years or uh, clubs and what have you that, that came and went. But it's all sort of part of the Warwick scene. The second part is, yonder is the Warwick Inn. And the Warwick Inn has a pretty remarkable history. And as people will talk about just from <laughs> what people had to wear to get into the Warwick Inn changed pretty dramatically over the years and actually changed back. Um, all these things will become apparent as we get on with what's going here, going on here. Um, that's really where we are. As I say, I've divided it into sort of two sections, and the first section will be the, the smaller, and in no sense are they smaller. Uh, some of them were pretty wild and pretty, pretty crazy, uh, but they didn't go on and on and on like the war begin has. Um, and the first one is 1950s Teenage Club. And I don't know, I think there are a couple people. There's Freddie. You want to introduce the panel, Steve? I'm sorry? You want to introduce ah, the panel? Thank you, thank you. I meant to do that. Uh, the panel. <laughs> this is James McRae. James. <laughs> no, he's here. Back in first grade. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, next to him, is, do you want to introduce yourself so we got the name correct? Sure, uh, Klon Kaler. Okay, Klon Dyke Kaler. Next to him, does he need an introduction? <laughs> I certainly do. Where's the fanfare? <laughs> okay. So we're ready to trump it. Do you have your name tag so you can read it? No, I don't. Okay. But uh, it's Michael Humphreys. <laughs> Next to Michael is Freddie Fellows. Thank you, Freddie. And that last but not least, Clyde Perkins, Jr. Thank you very much. The panel. And the panel. Um, okay, now I'll get back to where I should be. Um, we were talking, or going to talk, um, about the Teenage Club. And I'm looking at this gentleman in the first row here, and I'm looking down at Freddie, and I'm going to basically just throw things off to you guys. Well, I, think, I think that David's going to do that. Okay, David, go for it. Well, uh, Freddie's father. That's a good reason Fred for you to Harris. do it. <laughs> Uh, advised and ran 
with us, the, the Teenage Club, which had dances up here, what, every Friday night? Mm -hmm. And uh, a few other larger events, Teenage Impressions of uh, 53, which was a, uh, I think Emma Copeland with, helped write a lot of that uh, kind of a variety script. show. A variety show, and that was on a, a truck body for a stage up at the ball field. Wow. With headlights, cars pulled up onto the ramps with the headlights. Um, That's great. So I, you did this at night. I was part of that program. Uh, she wore red feathers and a hula hula skirt. <laughs> uh, I also uh, ran Pop's place, which was toward the end of the program. But uh, what what made it so that we could actually perform as well as we did was as we looked out, all we saw were all these headlights. <laughs> Not the crowd. No eye contact. <laughs> Um, there were also a number of trips that were sponsored. We went down to Boston to see the live performance of Oklahoma. Interesting with that one, of course we reserved tickets and walked up to the counter to get the tickets and they said, we can't let you in here. All these teenagers? <laughs> Probably about and, 20 uh, of us, yeah. Fred did some fancy talking and so <laughs> forth, and he finally got the tickets. Wow. And then they were praising us as they came back out. And very good seats, remember? We had huh? we had very good seats, too. Yeah. yeah. Not, not up in the balcony. <laughs> <laughs> When, David, when was the Teenage Club? Do you have any sense of 1950s? Yeah, I would say 52 to mm, 51, 54. Would you say about that, David? Quite a few yeah. years ago. Yeah, you said yeah. Teenage Impressions 53, is what you yeah. said. Yeah. 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 yeah, We also had a trip up to Mount Washington mm. on the school bus. <coughs> I left here about, I guess, about 11 o'clock at night. Go back the next night around 11 o'clock. Went up the Cog Railway. Yeah. Wow. Nice. Um, yeah. Uh, we went up the Cog Railway to the top of the of Mount Washington. Um, it was kind of a good thing because we had um, we had a meeting and we had pay dues and uh, elected offices, so we had kind of learned a little bit about the how to run a, a patriotic and <clears throat> democracy and all joining in and it was fun. We had good times. So. Yeah, we did round dances, square dances. Learned how to waltz and ballroom poker. dances. <laughs> I don't know what else. Yeah. Yeah. Was there a teacher that came and helped with the, the dancing? That? Was there a teacher, a dance teacher or someone that... Uh, no. Uh, you just figured it out. We taught each other. I remember c calling a couple of squid dances. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, yeah, my father was a good dancer, so I don't know. Great. Yeah. No, I don't think that we did. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, just, just curious. Well, um, can we move on to Poland Manor? And I'm going to look at you, Freddie. You want to do that one? Okay. Sure. All right. That, my father was a dreamer, if he was nothing else. Um, <laughs> and uh, he always thought anything is possible, didn't he? <laughs> People who knew my father, not too many here did. Um, and the uh, Pullman Manor was very short-lived. Um, it was incorporated uh, and had to have a, a liquor license, of course. It was incorporated by the state, a liquor license granted by the Board of Selectmen and the State Alcohol Beverage Commission. They were bylaws and they were Board of Governors and offices. President was Ralph Witherell. Uh, Vice President was Thomas O'Connor, the undertaker in um, Apple. Not anymore, but he was. Treasurer was Oscar Olson. Um, they had bylaws and so forth and so on. And um, 
they were going to open as a club, a private club, yeah, with dues. Uh, not any anything was going to go back in to develop the club, the money that they took in. Dues were very, very little. Individual, $2. Husband and wife, $3. The family, 5 You're not going to go too far with that money. <laughs> um, but um, they, were, they, they had big dreams. They had big dreams. I think it started, well, my father, um, well, he had started several businesses, and one actually, my mother ran until she passed away. Well, not until she passed away, but till she was 69. Um, and she lived to be 89, so she had 20 more years. But um, they had, it started, I think, in 1960 when Calvin and I got married. And, and we had our reception there. And my father used the cocktail lounge for, or the carriage head for a cocktail lounge. And he said, oh, well, you know, this is a pretty good idea. And so he did open a cocktail lounge. And there is a picture of it here. And he, you know, he had a, a fireplace and it had uh, nice, nice comfortable chairs for people to sit in. And I think that Howdy Keith was the bartender. And, and it was just a nice place to come up and have a drink and sit and relax and just chat and talk. It was, And so he had that for a few years. But then he thought, well, maybe we can do something a little bit more. So in um, the club opened in June, I believe. I got it here someplace. Uh, June 2nd, 1962 was when it opened. And one of the big things they had was a fish fry on Friday nights, all you could eat for a dollar. <laughs> and my father would go down to Boston, get the fish early in the morning. He did, the, he did everything. I mean, he did the cooking. He, didn't, he had wait staff and so forth. But he did the cooking and he did the shopping and planning and so forth. Um, but, um, and the meals, well, this was actually... Baked or boiled stuffed lobster, four twenty-five. Prime roast beef, three fifty, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, broiled Rocky Mountain brook trout, two twenty-five. I'd have that. But um, and so, um, but they they had big dreams at what they wanted to do. They wanted to expand, and they wanted to um, well, they they wanted to have a swimming pool. They wanted to uh, have a lighted um, skating rink, outdoor skating rink for the winter. Uh, they wanted uh, tennis courts, um, maybe even go as far as to have saddle horses and trap shooting. So they had all of these big plans. Um, but as I say, it started in June. Uh, my father took ill and he died um, December 4th, 1964. Wow. And of course that was the end of that. Um, and at that time uh, he was trying to, um, and had this paperwork here, change from a private um, alcohol license to um, the public, and there were two at that time available in Warwick. One had the Warwick Inn, so it wouldn't interfere with the Warwick Inn. And the paperwork was in the works for him to change that. But he passed away, um, and as you can imagine, it was not a financial success. <laughs> and um, so he left my mother with a lot of loose ends and a lot of debt. I will have to say my mother paid off every penny. Mm -hmm. Freddie, just quickly, where was where was it? Where was where the, the commune was? Where else? No, I, I don't know whether people know that. Just so oh, they didn't know that. So that that's where I, I lived. Yeah. That was was my home. Um, but just that's another story. There may be white house. Don't know. The white house. Yeah. Yeah. Where's the name Bullen come from? That it was my grandfather's. Well, my great grandfather's name, who was in the Civil War. Um, and he was the chief of police of the city of Cambridge, and that was his summer home. Wow. And so my father, as a young boy, always went there, and he always wanted to have that, and and it was sold out of the family, and uh, he bought it from Mr. McDonald, I believe his name was, who was the um, head of all the CCC camps in this area, mm -hmm. and so when it was going to be sold, it, uh, my father bought it, and then we moved up here, so that that's it's a family name. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Not a question, but Nancy and I did eat there. <laughs> really? Cool. And what did you have? <laughs> I don't remember, but her father took us up there when we were 
Just married. Just married. Oh. Did you go maybe for a Thanksgiving dinner one time? No, it wasn't Thanksgiving dinner. I think I think my father just asked us to go out, and, and so we did. I think it, was, it probably was. Remember how we talked about our parents bothering? Yes, I think probably. <laughs> 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 Your dad would do some printing, and my, my father would do exactly. some cooking. And, and so my father would go, we, he would go out to collect the debt. Yeah, <laughs> I think you're right. <laughs> That's great. Any more comments, questions? Okay, the next item on the list is something called the Uptight Disco Barn. And we have an expert on that well. at the very end of the table. <laughs> and, and I'm going to also uh, put, put George on, uh, on call on this one too, because he's got some interesting stories about spending time there. The, uh, the Uptight the, uh, Barn was on Flower Hill. And uh, it ran a very short period of time, about maybe two years at the most. Um, the The farm that it was on is one of the oldest, uh, one of the older houses and barns in the in town. Now, uh, going back to the uh, 1700s, and. Uh, it, through the years, it went through various families and then ended up in the Nordstead family in the late 1800s, late 1890s. And uh, then Carl and Rotha Nordstead had the place until, what was it, 1964, I think. And yeah, and they sold it to a gentleman, uh, Robert Curtis. And he had it for uh, until 1970 when it was sold to Herman Wirth. And so it was in this time period, uh, around 1967, 68. And um, I, I, I'm not sure what their plan was. Uh, uh, Robert went into a partnership with somebody, another man who it, well, I think it was his idea, and I don't have that gentleman's name. I don't know if anybody here knows it, but uh, I, I wasn't able to f figure out who it was. But they decided to have a disco barn, and they decorated this barn. And uh, um, they, uh, some of the relics from it still may be in the barn. Uh, there was uh, a w panels of broken bottles that they glued they glued broken bottles to panels and hung them on the wall to create it create a psychedelic effect or something <laughs> and, and the furniture was all rough hewn uh, and made of uh, various chunks of wood and all of this sort of thing and it, um, I was around that era. Um, I'm Greg, Greg Williams. My dad and I ran the Warwick Inn for 20 years. Um, so dad bought the Warwick Inn in the spring of 66. And uh, these two beatniks from <laughs> New York City came up and became very friendly with Bob, Bob Curtis and his wife. And uh, talked them into doing over this barn into a discotheque. <laughs> and they got all of, well, four or five of us youngsters in town. Um, I was a senior that year, so it was me and the uh, the Fellows brothers, and you, you were there also? No, I was too young. Too I, young. I <laughs> came in a little later on. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, yeah. we fixed up this neat old barn. Uh, they broke um, mirrored glass and then glued it all in mm. to a wall, and then we had... Go go cages with with um, chains coming down for go go there. dancers. The go go cages are still there. Wow, Josh. are they really? Oh, yes, <laughs> still there. They had a, a beautiful uh, New York City um, three way stoplight. Uh, yeah, I think that uh, might or, still be there too. There too. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yes. Who are the dancers? <laughs> it doesn't voluntary anyone can talk into it. <laughs> 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 it, it, it right. They actually used to make tables, like we'd cut a slab of wood and yeah. then put another piece on it, so it'd be like a mushroom. And then they actually filled burlap bags with insulation for pillows to sit on the floor. Okay. <laughs> 
And uh, we had a loss in the first and second floor. <laughs> but all we sold was soda and food to go. And they tried to make a parking lot out of a field. And I can remember the yeah. rain coming and having to push cars out of the field to get them just on the road to get the places. That's that was what I remembered the most about this. Uh, they, well, they the parking back then. Flower Hill was not paved; it was dirt road all the way through, and maybe the lower end from Route 78 was paved. But other than that, it was all dirt, and it's a little remote out there. And there was cars getting stuck in the mud. They tried to run a kitchen, and in the colder weather, it froze up constantly. Yeah. And, and then they, they became disagreements, and it all kind of fell apart. And I think they had a lot to argue about. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, help was volunteer. Yeah. And it was the summer of '66, and they did summer of '67, and yeah, that was it. Yeah. Know? Yeah. It yeah. Just ran out of energy. You know? okay. Klein the, and, and where did people come from that, that came to this place and what were the crowds like? Well, I have no, I, that I don't know. So like I say, I was young. The only time I went there was, uh, I was fortunate enough at the time I was a teenager here that we had a very active youth group and teenage group during that time period. And we went up there for a dance one time the youth group and that's how I got to see the inner workings of the place and what they what they had there and that was the only real exposure I had to it was going to a dance there one night and it, it, it was pretty cool what they did but very out of place for <laughs> okay. where, where it was put yeah. um, from a slightly different perspective George Day <laughs> I was on the police department. Oh. <laughs> yes, that's right. And one of the requirements of either the town officials or the owners was that a police officer had to be on duty. So I spent a lot of time, with, you know, as the duty cop. And uh, as I remember, you know, patrons used to come from Half Long Orange as well as Warwick. And the girls used to like taking turns, getting in the cave and dancing. That's where the go-go girls came from, right from the audience. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. These things were not safe. There was no way any of this, probably anything in the place would have met today's standards for for safety and and protocol for safety because uh, they, they, they I wouldn't have gotten in it and danced around, I know that. It did not look safe. It was, it was a huge old barn structurally, the, the beams were huge. Yeah. So um, structurally it wouldn't have caved in, but uh, Maybe, maybe some of the planks might have given away. Yeah. Well, I don't. There, there wasn't too much safety no change to hold you in if you w no. went over. <laughs> they, had the, they had the chains coming from the ceiling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they were about ten feet off the floor or so. Yeah, oh yeah, so the second floor. It now. didn't look like anything I would want to get into. <laughs> and there's nothing you can add to that, George. In terms of calling ambulance. <laughs> so it, 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 it worked. My recollection is. The, the entertainment were the papers. Yeah, they yeah. Took turns yeah. To get in the cage and dance right. go-go. <laughs> <laughs> Who, Who provided the music? Who provided the music? Was it music? What music did you it have? It was uh, um, recording. Recording. It wasn't yeah. live. Yeah. There were some bands, though, sometimes. Yeah, maybe. Wow. Yeah. Well, any more comments on... Uh, and it's the barn is still there, and apparently some of the appointments are still there. <laughs> so I'll leave that to you. So with that, we'll move on to um, I believe it's going to be Mr. Humphrey speaking to some of these things. Why? This, this, <laughs> well, we'll see. <laughs> um, we're going to probably unfair, but I'm going to heap dinner theater and phone bone two separate events <laughs> together. And Michael, with a little help from his friends, Alan Morgan hasn't left yet, uh, and a few others. Uh, can you tell us about 
Let's let's start with dinner theater. Well, that was a, a creation that was brought to my attention by uh, Reverend Ray, um, and uh, he was talking about doing something um, to uh, raise money, having an event at the um, town hall. And so it started pretty simply with uh, a meal being served, being cooked up downstairs. And um, for entertainment, uh, the very first one we did involved uh, Scott Wallace. Mm. Yeah, I know. And uh, we decided to do the um, moth. Uh, the, at the time, the gypsy moth was kind of chewing up the forests. So we did a skit on um, making it in Massachusetts. <laughs> <laughs> and it, uh, it amounted really to uh, having a very large, um, I don't know exactly what it was that was the moth, but we had these big moth balls that we were throwing at these moths. And that was pretty much it. I mean, it was, <laughs> I was new at doing skits. And um, uh, it was it was well received. Uh, I remember mispronouncing um, Rotha Norstadt's name and um, getting nudged. Uh, I can't remember who it was that nudged me. It might have been Liz uh, Whipple. Yeah, but anyway, we kind of got through that, and it was a very simple affair. I mean, it certainly blossomed after that when I got the idea that, wow, we can do some really outrageous things up here. <laughs> <laughs> and we did. Tell, tell about the tutus. Oh, that's, yeah, that's down the road a little yeah. bit, but... Yeah. George, you got a question? Well, you know, one of the skits that I can remember uh, was the Rocket Man. Yeah. The Rocket Man. Yeah. So, Mrs. Rocket, please stand up. You were there. <laughs> but anyway... This thing was unbelievable. They took one of the windows out of the town hall, and <laughs> right was the rocket man. And he got in this thing, and they shot him off like a rocket <laughs> right out the window. Yeah, that was and the same window. to us, outside they had some guys with a whole bunch of mattresses, and he landed outside the window on some mattresses. Uh, okay. Al Morgan was another person to go out that window in a skit. <laughs> um, that was the, uh, what was that, the, the uh, robot, right? The robot that you had, um, Al, you were... I just remember a robot throwing me out the window. Yeah, that was, that was the robot. That was the wasn't, robot. Wasn't Al the faceless bureaucrat? Oh, yes, he was. Yes. Yeah, we had other... Yeah. yeah. My we God. did 35 dinner theaters. <coughs> well, that was years. the question. How long did this last? Quite a few years. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, sure. yeah. Yeah. I got some help from George. George came in shooting the fire extinguisher once. Yeah. And, uh, we had all the fire alarm, uh, f what were the rotating lights in the windows for a, a prison break. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. God, there were a lot. There was a lot. Everything was. Um, what would you say, fair game <laughs> to take on. That. One of the great ones was the robots with Jim and Sue McRae. Oh. That, was, that was unbelievable. That was an intelligent skit. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. One of the few. Yes, the it was, it was the mannequins. physical yeah. therapy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. uh, what was it? Therapy. Family therapy. Mm. No, the you, mannequins she's talking about. Oh, the about. mannequin yeah. one. Oh, okay. Yeah, the mannequin one. Somebody saw that and took it to um, New York City. That we got a, I got a letter or something saying thank you for that skit. And they went down. They kind of duplicated it. Did you get it. no check? No. <laughs> You're still getting residuals, right, Mike? Yeah. What's that? You're getting residuals on that. Oh yes. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> the first, the That's first time for. we got to do that with you, um, Sue had a bag lady role. And huh. she started the evening in the parking lot confronting people coming out of the cars <laughs> and was pretty darn convincing and was unrecognizable and people were just kind of like moving away. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was a pretty stunning it was a pretty stunning piece. So Michael, I just wanted to turn back the machine a little bit to think about we talked about the windows, how the 
the robot threw the guy out the window oh, and yeah. threw the rocket man out the window. We also came in through the window. The, the road when we, crew. When we, when we did the, the detour for the detour for the detour. detour. For the detour. <laughs> <laughs> we went up to the center of town and the mm. town hall on that night. That was the closest we ever came to injuring somebody yes. in the audience. <laughs> oh, in the and, audience. And, and we got it on tape. <laughs> so we got it on, we, it was recorded. Um, Steve was trying to break through the window the first night with a shovel and it wouldn't break and it wouldn't break. So eventually it did. But um, uh, so the next night I said, okay, listen, I just won't put the screw in as far. So um, it, Steve gets up for the next night and he goes like this, expecting it to be hard. He knew I was going to make it easier. And he slammed into that thing, and the, the video of it shows this piece of wood coming right at the camera, keyholing like this, <laughs> and it goes right by um, Al Miner. It right. just missed him, and Al never moved. He just sat there. <laughs> Well, that's part of the show, you know, I mean, he must have felt pretty safe. <laughs> but it, it yeah. really went right by him. Yeah, you were completely in control. Yeah. Lester Scafidi came up, because I was shaking after that, be, you know, before I went on to the next thing, and he said, it's okay, nobody got hurt, Michael, come on, we got to keep going. So we did, but boy, that, whoa. Yeah. So, um, How long did they last? They started and finished? In terms of time, any sense of that? A couple of hours. No, I wasn't even thinking hours. No, I was thinking about the how many years. Yes, we got up to uh, I think what did we get? High thirties, thirty something. I remember. We had quite a few. We had quite a few. I mean, Jeff Wall Jeff Wallace was writing the first ones with me. So it went all the way from. That time, I mean, I remember being up in the attic of the, uh, maybe not the attic, but the second floor of the inn, uh, typing up these skits. Um, and uh, Jeff was really, he was pretty instrumental. He was pretty crazy, had sure. certain things to say. <laughs> had the right equipment. To yes, it. yes. But that, it must have started, it's got to be early 80s, is when the first dinner theater started. Um, and I will just say that, because we were still in town, and we left, you know, mid yeah. and there had already been a few of them. So, how long? Does anybody have a sense of when the last dinner theater was? I mean, so it was more than one a year? I was just going to say, yeah. it, it was one a year. In the well, there were, there were two, we to did. And you would do two of them, one Saturday, yeah, one Friday, Yeah, we'd do one Friday Saturday. and Saturday yeah. night, oh, yeah. Nice. yeah. Um, yeah. Good question. So, <laughs> yeah, so, Steve. So, so the... The system of dinner theater was that there was the the skits that Michael would write, which there were probably about four or five of them for yeah. a single dinner theater. Very interfaced with that was also the real entertainment, the people who had had skills, like like Clyde has played there, and there'd be different people. Yeah, different musicians. Yeah. Sing, but then then the skit would be like a running skit for the whole night, the beginning, the beginning opening performance, and then there'd be two two or three different serious. Folks, and then we put another piece of the skit together, and so it was like yeah. A, like a they weren't story. necessarily continuous. They were usually yeah, pretty different, true, yeah. pretty different, different skits. Yeah. yeah. I remember the Rogelbergs? They they had a son, Andrew. 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 They could play the piano. He thought he was about eleven years old. And yeah. He would knock your socks off. Yeah. yeah. It was really amazing. What? Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah, we pulled from all different yeah, ages. Yeah. Played guitar. Yeah. Did he? <laughs> I thought he, he did. That was one of the nice things about the dinner theater was it brought the talent out from uh, the, the local community um, of all ages. Um, and the skits brought people out of their shells a bit. And because uh, it j wasn't just kind of the, the more zany people doing them, but uh, Michael would pull in, you know, other people that you wouldn't expect to be doing Ted, something Ted like fellows. that. Sure. And yeah. uh, Marge Fellows got up and did that uh, Reed Petit dance. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that was yeah, a big yeah. surprise. So it was, it really was a big community event mm -hmm. because, and it pulled in many people and, and they did things that you wouldn't normally see them doing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it, it was before my time, but, uh, it, but I heard about it from almost the moment I was in town, and yeah. many times over, was Jeff flying above the crowd, 
and and the tutu on the on the rope. Oh yeah. Yes, that, and he was so replaced by uh, Dave Shoemaker. Yes. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Dave, he was so excited by that skit. He put the star, his his star, right on his breast, <laughs> on, and when he flew out into the audience, he just thought that was the best. <laughs> Did, did Al Miner have another part later on in Dinner Theater? No, no, he was just, the just lucky to get out the of there alive. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, well, I think maybe the last one was 2013 or so. Wow. That long ago. Wow. Wow. Yes. He had just wow. moved to town. Seems only Super. yesterday. That would be about 30 years or so. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Oh so, yeah, there were definitely. Michael, free. what are the plans for for <laughs> I'd say as long as COVID, uh, it's gone. So yeah, yeah, so we could. Uh, There's going to be a sign-up sheet for. for okay. For, for <laughs> uh, yeah. Anybody who is interested, I mean, I I can certainly come up with material. <laughs> <laughs> I just look at my friends and write about their lives, and it's it's, it's plenty right there. <laughs> Okay, well with that, and Michael, you're still on the hot seat, uh, there's another item on on the list here, phone bone. Oh, yeah. And, uh... <laughs> that got out of hand. <laughs> <laughs> the last, well, there were small ones. It started with Tom Kiley. Tom Kiley thought the coolest thing in the world is to have a clam bake. So we had a clam bake, and he said, we got to get music. So we had music, and then um, we did that uh, on the front lawn there at Hoot Hill. And uh, the next year, we moved it across the field, uh, across into the field. Above Clyde's house, right? Yes. Clyde Senior. Yeah. Mm. And, um, well, it just, there was incentive to, let's do more. Let's do more. Let's do more. So, um, the one in 1986 was the last one I knew that, that I just couldn't keep doing them. They were getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And, you know, we had the, <laughs> we had the, let the police know, and we had to let the fire department know that we were going to be setting off fireworks, and there was a huge bonfire. It was a big, big bonfire. It was only seven cords of wood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the it people. got to the point, you know, I was fire chief at the time. It got to the point where we, I brought the fire truck up there to have it on Just to park it there. Right? Yeah. Well, there were fireworks, um, which we had Scott Wallace uh, in old... Um, Close with a bunch of old license plates on him, and we said, "This is our li licensed firework operator." <laughs> <laughs> and he, uh, anyway, yeah. But the the big, the most exciting thing about it, I thought, was the um, the rock operettes, because we had been kind of developing this concept of a rock operette, and that's taking a rock and roll song from any age, really. I mean, we did. Well, Ted Cady got in his <laughs> a towel wrapped around him, and he did uh, Splish Splash, I was taking a bath. <laughs> now that's something to see. <laughs> I was thinking that. <laughs> and uh, the, the, I think the most exciting was, was uh, Paradise by the Dashboard Lights. That was an exceptional skit. That was, uh, we, well, it has three parts. The song has three parts. So, um, uh, anyway, you know, we had, we had a half a car up there. Steve came up with a half a car. You had the front end of a car. And so we had a light behind the dash so you could see it, and Nancy Lamb and I were supposedly making out in the front, and then she kicks me out, and then Chuck Whipple was the announcer for the baseball game part, and then we ran, the, somebody ran the bases. Um, <laughs> it was, it was a, that was a big skit. That was pretty cool. Yeah. What'd you do for a stage? Oh, well, yeah, we thank you for asking. Um, I got, um, what's the name of the guy, the construction company there in Greenfield? Mackin? What is it? Mackin? Yes. Yeah. It was two Mackin flatbed tractor trailer trucks. And we brought the, they parked them up next to each other and we strapped them together and we drove stakes in the stake holes and drilled holes through those and had a gold colored rope that went around to keep people from falling off which was a good thing because at the end of the first uh, at the end of the night we had um, a um, a spike high-heeled shoe driven into the floor of the wood flatbed uh, trailer and uh, 
we, you know, was stuck there. It's like from the dance. Somebody was really excited on there. <laughs> and that was uh, the next morning. The next morning, I came out and I hear this snoring. I'm going through the field looking at this event leftovers. It was pretty disastrous. A lot of cleaning up to do. And I heard somebody snoring. <laughs> And I'm walking around, I get tuned in, and it's Rusty Fellows. <laughs> he has crawled underneath the hood of this car that we brought up for the skit the night before, and he's un and it's reverberating. <laughs> it's like this. And I look under, and there's Rusty Fellows, and his feet are sticking out. So, and that, that was the same night that um, Karen and um, Ray Wilder at. at uh, I think it was 5.30 in the morning or 6 in the morning, I heard, heard music going on. I thought, what the heck? So I go outside, and they're still bumping and grinding on the stage, just this little music box that they have. Very excited. <laughs> yeah, they were, yeah. So, um, something else to talk about. Where did my name come from? Where what? Where's the name Phone Bone come from? Uh, from Don Martin. Don Martin, Mad's oh, maddest right artist. Here. You know, um, right. Phone Bone was his, that was the last, that was the surname for a lot of his characters. I remember doing a skit there with Jeff Wallace and others um, after Hi Ho, Hi Ho, it's off to work we go. Oh, I was in that skit too. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't there. <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't remember that skit. But. Yeah, yeah, we did the the Seven Dwarfs, exactly. Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. We also Dwarfs. had uh, yeah. Dick Wiener Gardner doing the tequila. Oh, yeah, was that, that, well, that was me blowing fire, right? Yes, and he was drinking one fifty one. So when it came to tequila, he let out, he'd light a match and. A five foot flame would come out. Of yeah, that's now. a big. I can get a pretty big flame. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Tequila. <laughs> that's right. That's Highway right. To hell by AC DC too. Was that? We did Highway to Hell by AC DC. Yes. Yeah. Oh, that's. Yeah, you had the speakers all rigged up to explode. That, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Mm. It was uh, it was uh, A B C D I think it was the best name. We called it A B C D. I remember Bert building the speakers for that, and we had cans of gunpowder in there and everything. I think interesting that you kind of skipped over Michael. Why it was such a big such a big success. We talked about the entertainment, but the fact that it was. All the clams you could eat, all the coin you could eat, <coughs> all the beer you could drink for ten dollars helped. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, um, yeah, we had uh, neon sculptures up in the woods. I got them from Gary Moisey. We had slot machines. We, we had real slot machines. And people up there putting quarters in and going, Hitch! like this. And every now and then you'd hear, yeah! <laughs> so, I mean, it was... It was in the middle of the woods? Right. Yeah, right on the edge of the field. The slot machines were right on the edge of the field. Did the, and uh, the neon sculptures were back in the back. Oh, oh. And in the had, high striker. Yes, we had That's we had right. the high wow. striker from a carnival, uh, yes. a high striker yes. ring the bell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, we had the ladies' room back in the woods, and I can't remember who it was. Some uh, somebody in town that you all know said, "I hope there are no video cameras back there." <laughs> <laughs> oh no, it's. <laughs> It was a nice little ladies' room. We had a cane seat, you know. We took the caning out, and put, it in there, put some, put it, put a sheets around. It was very private. As, I, as I remember, the, the the title for for the ladies' room was the setters, and for the men it was the pointers. <laughs> right. Yes. Pointers and setters. We were very clever. <laughs> well, Michael. Nowadays, you just need a poinsettia. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> um, we've obviously missed things, and we'll think of things, smaller events that have occurred in Warwick over the years, but that sort of rounds out the first section of our program here. And now we are moving into the Warwick Inn. Do we not want to mention the bed races? The bed races? 
I oh, think yes. Yes. we can mention the bed races. Yeah. I hate to leave that out. Okay, there were bed yeah, races, and who knows anything about the bed races? Yeah. George, go for it. Yeah. That was uh, entertainment, so to speak. It was done on old only. Yep. We ended up getting some hospital beds on wheels. <laughs> the hospital beds were on wheels. And, and, uh, I wonder where five those came from. <laughs> Somebody had to sit in the bed with a hospital Johnny on it. <laughs> and then four people on each corner of the bed. We started right out here, right across from the library. They had to go down around the corner to the chapel, turn around and come back. And when they got to the starting <coughs> line, the guy in the bed had to jump out, take his Johnny off, give it to one of the other players. He had to put the Johnny back on and get back in the bed and then the remaining four would go out to the chapel again and come back. Wow. And it was all time. Whoever could do that in the quickest amount of time. <laughs> One of the problems was that very few of the beds made it the whole way with their caster wheels staying on. <laughs> and there was this horrendous noise. <laughs> You almost expected sparks coming off, but... <laughs> you know, we did that on a whole... We did that whole home day for three or four years, I guess. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. So did you have to repair the beds every year? Uh, I think they were junkers that yeah, somebody... They, they like, must have been. The Gail worked in the hospital. Yeah. Uh, and I think she ended up getting a hold of them. Yeah. They were probably junkers that yeah. she brought home. It's like the upright pianos. <laughs> yeah, yeah one... The upright pianos through the knot hole. We did a piano through the knot hole contest one old home day. The school up here had three decrepit piano upright pianos in the classrooms, and we didn't know what to do to get rid of, the, rid of them. So we had a piano through the knot hole contest and a piece of plywood with a 12 inch hole in the middle of it. And we had crews of five or six uh, with sledgehammers and saws and Very wire cutters. <laughs> and, and within a half an hour, these three pianos were reduced to rubble and it all had to go through the the knot hole. Except and for the soundboard. Except, yeah, the, 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 the iron frame, uh, yeah. That's uh, but uh, everybody was bleeding by the time we got done. There was, everybody got wounded to was some one, degree I when was, we uh, did that. I was yeah. the uh, referee or whatever, yeah. and somebody took a swing with a sledgehammer and it just missed someone's head. Yeah. And I said, hold it, stop. And I just said, guys, we got to be careful. Yeah. <laughs> Can you imagine saying that in Warwick? <laughs> <laughs> but that was, uh, yeah, yeah, it was pretty exciting. Uh, three pianos in about uh, 30 minutes and there was nothing left to them, really. Yeah. Karen Young was not happy about that. She thought it was oh, a sacrilege. shame. Mm -hmm. and she, mm -hmm. she used to stand there Protesting, you know, she had a yeah. sign. Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I forgot about that. Well, she was quite a pianist. Yes. Yeah. Well, Karen is someone that I was actually going to say for the end. Jim had a couple of comments, and uh, maybe we'll just sort of do it now. There are there are a few people um, that I think we should probably make note of, and Karen Young and her. What was her maiden name? Anset. Anset. Yes. A N S E T T. Right. Mm. And Karen was a remarkable person. I don't know how many people here actually knew Karen. Um, she and David were married for a number of years, and I think there are a number of things about Karen that I don't even have to go into. But she was a phenomenal musician, um, really phenomenal, and was on a track to be a concert musician, and also at the same time on a track to become a doctor. So there was a sort of collision, and her life was it was it was very tough for her. Um, but she is responsible for the beautiful Yamaha piano, which is in the town hall. And Jim, I, if you want to uh, chime in at all, well, the, my my ma Sue and I rented from Karen and David when we came to town. So they were some of the first people on, on that and that process that we encountered. Um, the first person was, was Ted Katie at the door when we went to this fellow said, 
hi, I'm Snortbees, you want some rum? And I, I answered, hi, I'm Dr. Irving Fishbein III, or something like that. I didn't realize he really was Snortbees. I thought he put me on. Um, and yes, I do. Um, Karen, uh, but what I remember in the story of the piano, her persuading the town hall to pony up for the worth of having a fine instrument in town was fresh. You know, that was a recent town meeting before we came here. So I heard that immediately, but later in, later in the arc, um, after Ralph Hills moved to town, who is also a, a real dynamic mu musical presence, we'll get to that later, there's one night they did a concert together and they uh, lifted the, the Yamaha onto the stage mm -hmm. and either Karen or Ralph brought their grand up to the town hall and put that on the stage. And they did, uh, um, they did an avant-garde piece with the two of them going at each other that was just one of the stunning, stunning events in my memory here. I, I wish I knew what the piece was. I don't know if anybody mm -hmm. knows that, but was anybody else there for that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh my yeah. gosh. Yeah. That, well, Ralph could uh, transcend age yes. easily. He could be so this was, a young person. Yeah. Right? Might so as well just go right on with with Ralph because Ralph is another person on the list of people that should really be recognized. Okay. Well, this is jumping over the Warwick Inn part. Then, yeah. But but Ralph Ralph moved to town after I was here, and. Um, <clears throat> And he had been a music teacher down south, somewhere south of D.C. in that general geography. Mm. I'm not sure right where. And um, uh, we pretty quickly started f forming musical community and events through that, that that he'd bring out, that he'd bring to the town hall. He, he gathered with a, a several gentlemen and uh, kind of a rotating cast. They uh, called themselves a Horace Meadow Jazz Band, and Horse, Jell Horse Mountain. I think Horse right. Mountain. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yes. And and um, uh, Ralph had been a classical pl classical player his whole life, and this was new to him too. And he's kind of excited about playing. Um, it, it was a traditional, you know, tra uh, traditional pre thirty five type jazz. Um, with with just fine fine players and he he he'd create events there weren't you know ralph had a series of uh of of events at the town hall some of that jazz band some uh just gathering up musicians and forming ensembles for the night and and bring it up uh, just is a real dynamic musical presence in the town when he was here and i'm i'm not i don't i don't go to the church but he played he was a real significant presence musically at the church. He played piano for the church for a long time as well. Mm. If I could... School. He went to the schools. Mm. He helped. Mm -hmm. Going back to Karen Young for a moment, when, they, when we first got the piano here in town, um, there, there was a gentleman that lived here in town uh, that bought our old farm on... Richmond Road, uh, Paul Olefsky, yeah. and he was a, a cellist. Um, I believe one of the symphonies, he, he was with the Houston Symphony Orchestra, but his brother, Julian Olefsky, was the head of the music department at UMass, and he had a sister, Olivia, Olivier mm -hmm. and Olivia Olefsky, who was a pianist in New York City, and they, she, Karen brought them together. Uh, I talked to Paul. I had introduced her to Paul, and they hit it off right away. And she asked them to come to a concert with our new piano. And uh, um, so we had uh, Carnegie Hall level <laughs> people. Mm -hmm. uh, to one of our first concerts on that. With the Olefsky Trio. Yeah. They, um, yeah. They had the comment um, after the their concert, uh, he said his wife had um, Steinway fingers and uh, then said something about, oh, yeah, yeah. remember that? Uh, yeah. Even yeah, on the yeah, Yamaha. Yeah, yeah, Yamaha keyboard with Steinway with fingers. Steinway yeah. fingers. <laughs> yeah. And Karen wasn't happy with it. <laughs> Wow, that's good. 
Um, amazing, and I remember some of those. And I, and I went to one of Karen's concerts at UMass too, where she uh, uh, did a uh, concerto with a uh, piano concerto with full symphony, and uh, yeah, it, it was amazing. And one other person, just sort of quickly here, is Lucinda, known as Cindy Ray, uh, and I'm mentioning Cindy uh, because she she's actually the wife, or was then the wife of the minister who Michael was raising all the money for uh, through Dinner Theater. Um, but Cindy put together a number of plays in town which were pretty remarkable, and she was actually an incredibly good director and could get a pretty disparate mm -hmm. again, which was a cool thing in town, uh, mix of people together and perform, and the results were pretty incredible. So just, just that. I don't know. Uh, that's... Before we get on to the war again, I was going to do this at the end, but other people, and I'm sure there are a bunch that we have uh, probably omitted, but... Uh, well, just if you tagging, I mean, we have Tony Reimer that comes and has done beautiful, your son, I mean, you could speak, but it just made me think we're still walking in those steps mm -hmm. to have just the superb music. Do you want to share anything? Um, Tony's in his 30s now, he's a cellist. Since he was small, he's in Berlin now and playing with the symphony and touring a lot around the world. And we expected, maybe, I don't know, we didn't put out very many chairs. We didn't think there'd be many people. He got a, we got a cultural grant. Maybe two years, three years in a row. He's not coming this year. Maybe four years. And we got, it was so crowded, there were people standing upstairs. It passed the doorway up to the second floor at the mm. town hall. It, and a lot of there were a lot of people. It he was, was drenched in sweat. Oh, that's right. <laughs> he it's was. Really it was an amazing yeah. performance. It was like he'd run a marathon. I mean, he was mm -hmm. so. The, the music was beautiful. Mm -hmm. The so range of music teachers would use the hall for recitals. Mm -hmm. I've been to many recitals. You so and yeah. um, Elon had, had mm -hmm. recitals mm -hmm. there for his. Yeah, it's a great piano. Okay, should we move on now to the Warwick Inn, which is a big chunk of, uh, of things here, and we'll go move along quickly. I think I'm going to look at Freddie and maybe Clyde or George with Early, uh, and we want to go back to situations that occurred during the, the memory time of people who were here. So. Okay. Right. This was 65 years ago. Nothing like what was going on afterwards, I can That's tell you okay. that. That's <laughs> okay, but it's... Very calm. Um, when Calvin and I were uh, dating, we would go um, every Saturday night to the Warwick Inn, and the men had to wear a tie, a suit jacket. The women could not come in with uh, slacks on. You had to wear a dress or skirt. Mm. And um, you, we didn't do any wild things in the, in the dining room, anyhow, <laughs> in the dance hall. <laughs> <laughs> we had to be very, very sedate. It was very different. Um, 65 years ago, it was a different world. Mm -hmm. um, and we, but we had good times. It was fun. And we had Spain Ainsworth. I don't know if any of you knew Spain. Oh, yes. He, mm -hmm. he was he always did, the orchestra. He uh, had a little uh, mm -hmm. combo or whatever. And, um, and uh, Calvin's mother was uh, worked at the Warwick Inn. I waited at the table a couple of times when they had wow. different groups come up when they, you know, Viets, and this was when Viets and owned the inn. And there's a couple of pictures over there, mainly of Calvin's family when they were there, a part of his family. And um, you can see that they all, this was a typical Saturday night and it would be packed, and but people would be, um, and you had to behave a certain way. George probably has a story about that, about how you had to behave in the inn. <coughs> There's one guy I know, I work with my audience, Bob Brooks. He got into some kind of a tussle, a fight, and Bob kicked him out. And she, when she kicked somebody out, you never came back. That was her rule. And I don't know how many years later it was, Bob and his wife Esther, and Hank and Penny North. Penny was the dresser's daughter, Jackie Hatzel's sister. The two couples came in there one night together to dance, and Bob recognized Bob and said, "No, 
The other three can come in, but you can't. <laughs> and this was how many years after, George? This was how many years after he... Oh, uh, quite a few. <laughs> you know, I mean, you, you just... You, you behaved yourself. <laughs> you know, she kicked you out. That was it. <laughs> Freddie, can I ask? No, um, hi, Edson. Oh, oh, yeah. Freddie? Pardon me? Uh, you said, you mentioned that Spin, I'd heard earlier that, that Spin was often central to the music, but this time you said something that he, he led an orchestra. What was the nature of the ensemble that that well, he'd be really likely to have it, there? I it was Spin Answorth. I don't know what he had. I mean, I'm not too much in mu music. Well, but what? What would it be? A small combo? Would it be a big band? Oh no, probably about yeah. maybe three people or something. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Pretty much yeah. a trio. And yeah. The yeah. And the signature. Something that, like that. Yeah. The signature. Yeah. That right. Yeah. They, they call themselves the signatures. It was Spin Ainsworth, Slim Marsh from Peter Sam, and a guy by the name of Charlie on the drums. I can't remember his last name. I can't okay. either. But the three of them, they played all over the place, not yeah. just the one again. I even went down when my aunt and uncle, who used to have a summer place um, in Warwick, um, the McTurnans, and um, for their 50th wedding anniversary, he even went down to Hanscom Field where they were having their 50th wedding anniversary because, um, you know, they loved his music so much and, and he came down to it. For people that aren't aware, Spin Ainsworth was a piano player and organ, played electric organ. Uh, he was an organist in uh, yeah. the church on North Main Street in Orange for many years. Yeah. But he was a keyboard guy. I think he yeah. tuned the yeah, pianos over in Northfield piano. Mount Herman while I worked over there. Yeah. He was mm. sometimes he'd see him. Yeah. 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 But a different time. So that got us up to what? When was the, and I think Greg, you'll be part of this, or you have some sense of the history of this. Um, who owned the, when Spin was... Oh, well, Vi Edson when, when And Vi time. owned the, the, the inn until when, roughly? Well, I don't know. I think we have that. 1963. The, the, I was going to say early 60s. Yeah, okay. we have that someplace she, here. She, uh, she passed away in 1960, and then oh, her son, Albert Nill, no, ran it for a couple of years. Yep. And then <clears throat> Bob Lincoln, Jr., he tried to run it. But they, him and his wife Helen, they didn't make a go of it. And then the bank foreclosed on the inn. And that's when Bob and Elizabeth Curtis bought it. Bob and Elizabeth Curtis were the ones that owned North Were they, were they the same where the disco yeah. people? Mm -hmm. and, and I think it was Bob Jr. that was pretty much the one that ran the uh, disco, the uptight disco, right. <laughs> you know. And then uh, Bob Curtis died, and uh, his, his wife, Elizabeth, she ended up selling it to Charlie Williams, you know, Craig's father, and then continue on. Okay, so we're into the Williams years. Mm -hmm. And now it's the early 60s? Uh, it's late 60s. 1966. 66, <laughs> so, um, my father's good friend was a good friend of a real estate agent in New Jersey who was the brother-in-law of Mrs. Curtis. And he gets a hold of my father. Have I got a deal for you? <laughs> a 200-year-old in Massachusetts, 14 rooms to rent, full kitchen. So we came up once or twice, and um, my th father thought it was great, and uh, we wound up buying it. And then uh, a few times, we'd have no customers at all for a day. Or my father would kid around and say, well, we took in $2.25 today. You know? <laughs> anyway, my father kept the um, signatures for a couple of years, but... Um, they weren't drawing like they used to, you know. But he would sort of keep these, and called the sentimental music um, for the locals. And my father used to kid around that the Swedish mafia run by Oscar Olsen, and, <laughs> and um, they, they enjoyed the music. But, and of course, there was no cover. But um, we weren't covering costs at all on Friday nights. 
So maybe like the second year we owned it in 67, and that was the, my senior year in high school. So I lived here one year and went to Pioneer my senior year. And um, Alan and Greg Fellows, I Fellows maybe. became my best friends. Yeah. And uh, I can remember a story about the Poland Manor that, you know, my dad started running a fish fry for $1.35. <laughs> And the Paul and Manor was offering one for 99 cents. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I can remember Garlda, the, the, uh, the boy's mother, so your father's too expensive for that. <laughs> How can you make any money at a dollar thirty-five? Couldn't make any money at a dollar either. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but your father was sort of running it out of principle, you know? You know yeah, exactly. I can do it. I got these people in. The place is packed, but we're not making any money. So anyway, my father switched to country western music, and he had Curly Smith and the Nighthawks would play for forty-five dollars a night, three piece, and they would come from like uh, Keene. So they started doing good. So we started having Curly Smith and the Nighthawks Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, no cover charge, and it was forty-five dollars a night for the band. If there wasn't a fight. Each night, it wasn't a good night. It was a dull night, you know. So I was started out at 16 years old there. I was the short order cook, and I kept an eye on the pool room. And the next year, I went away to college. And uh, let me see. How long did the country music last. Greg, do you remember? Oh, the country music lasted. So I took off, I went to college in Boston for two years, and then in 1969 I went to Woodstock, and uh, that winter I took off for California for about five years. Uh, time of my life. Time of my life. Thought nothing of hitchhiking cross country. Went to the Mardi Gras twice, hitchhiked right from Greenfield in February. Not a, not a second thought at all. Um, I came back to Warwick in 1974, and of course my father and I had issues about my long hair and politics, etc. So um, he wouldn't let me run the inn. So I um, eventually had my girlfriend come back from California, who was Peggy Londall um, Wallace. Whoa. Wonderful girl. Of course, I wound up blowing that relationship. But um, finally, I went to work at Starrett's. After having not worked for a couple of years, I started there at 55 hours a week. It just drove me nuts. I, I could not stand the pounding of the uh, screw machines uh, hour after hour. You know, if it ran good, you just stood there and watched the machine. And uh, you just mic'd the uh, product, if it was mic'd okay. You just sat there for hours upon hours, and noise, and, and the coffee was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> so, Greg, so, what was happening at the end at that point? Your father was still running country was still western? Running country western music, but um, Dad never ran a tape in his down lower cash register. He always relied on honesty. And almost everybody who worked for him ripped him off, you know. Um, not to say in the early days, Buster Alden and his wife worked, and they were honest as the day is long, but Dad would start hiring people right out of the audience. I need a waitress. I can waitress. You know, we'd sell 20, 30 cases of beer and come out with $100. And he just uh -huh. couldn't believe it. Finally, he said, you know, after I worked, I was working uh, for three months at Starrett's, and I hated it. <laughs> and uh, he says, well, you're doing pretty good. You want to run the inn now? So I worked 55 hours a week, and then I started putting up posters for bands on Friday and Saturday night. And I'd come from San Francisco, where there was posters from uh, Fillmore East and Fillmore West, and I, rather than spend money on advertising in the newspaper, I took it upon myself to put up a hundred posters each week. 
which maybe wasn't a smart idea, but uh, that's the way I did it for about the first year or so, you know. And um, then I got a break right after starting. I was able to hire the Outer Space Band in the summer of 74. Got up and knocked on their door, and I knew they were going to play at the White House that following weekend, or the next weekend. And I was able to get come up to deal with Klondike and uh, got some free advertising for it. And then I got like three other bands who wanted to open for them. So we put on a festival. And uh, no cover charge, I think, on our three or four bands. Um, we served steak and fries. So I, the next week I found plates all over the yard outside. <laughs> but um, it was so successful, and the place was packed, the state police came, we couldn't <laughs> drive through Warwick, uh, the, the roads were down to one lane, and you know, you try and get up on the stage and say, could you please move your car, it was like a joke. And, uh, but anyway, it turned out to be a great success. Of course, I thought, oh, every weekend's going to be like this. Well, that didn't turn out so, so you know, I, I learned to play the game of, you know, um, juggling the price of, per band, you know, depending how many people they could bring or how well they were known. And uh, that became quite like a guessing game, you know? So and How well Craig, you know and how many people can you bring? How about at this point we sort of tell people more about what the Outer Space Band was and why it had such a draw? We happen to have a member of the Outer <laughs> Space Band here. All right. Um, and you, we'll come back to you. Yeah. Can so, I just say one thing before you move on, just yeah. for the sense of chronology? I worked in Keene for a while with a woman who I think played in your country music era here. And since you, you uh, talked about a fight every night, uh, she, she, um, she talked about playing the, the Warwick Inn, and, and she said, it wasn't one of the places that had chicken wire over the stage, <laughs> but it was really close. <laughs> and, and, you know, he mentioned the name Curly Smith. One thing I remember about Curly Smith, he always wore a cowboy hat. Mm. But when he took it off, he was bald as a cue-ball. <laughs> 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 he was Curly Smith. <laughs> Should have been Shiny Smith. <laughs> <laughs> so, Klondike, would you uh, tell us a little you bit betcha. about the Outer yeah. Space Band? Sure, and uh, well, going from classical music and coat and tie clientele, this is quite a change. Um, <clears throat> I want to set the stage a little bit for uh, Outer Space and Wendell and how we ended up in Warwick because it's uh, an important part of the story. It was 1973 we moved to Wendell and uh, we were uh, one of five or six bands that were renting houses in there from a, a realtor in Amherst named Fred Boyajian who had bought a bunch of distressed homes and they didn't care who lived in them. And, uh, we were uh, a group of seven people with two sound guys, uh, two managers, and some hangers-on. Um, there were over 50 musicians and techs living in Wendell at that time, bands like Loose Caboose, the Magic Music Band, mm -hmm. Just Dandy, uh, Rick King was a member of that band, uh, Fairchild Sundance, to name a few. <clears throat> um, when we came to Wendell, uh, we were pretty much fresh out of college, and uh, hey, it was the, just after the 60s, and I was at Woodstock too, Greg. I'm so, I didn't see you there, though. <laughs> um, uh, well, locals really kind of raised their eyebrows. Suddenly there was this influx of, uh, of hippies and uh, uh, guys living together like renegade uh, fraternity kids from UMass suddenly had taken over the center of Wendell. Um, acceptance came slowly but it, it kind of came in a really funny way i think you guys can appreciate this we would be climbing the hill from wendell depot in an old station wagon and a, a freight truck behind us at about 6 30 in the morning on a monday coming back from jackson cambridge or some college gig that ran through the weekend and all the folks that worked at the mills in Orange would be going down to work. <laughs> and they realized we're just guys coming back from a job, right? It was all about that work ethic, and they accepted us pretty, pretty quickly after that, and a lot of us were members of the fire department. 
I still live there up until about uh, 2017, so it's really been a great run. Um, but anyway, there was really no place to play back then other than about 100 miles away. Occasionally we'd play at, uh, at the colleges down the valley, but a lot of the, the trips were made to Boston, Albany, and other places around uh, the Northeast. Um, but uh, because of our population, our music population in Wendell, we were actually able to convince the town to let us use the town hall for a rehearsal studio and an occasional concert. So this was again, 1973, uh, 74. Uh, the only place to hang out was either Baloo's store, which also sold gas at the time. Um, it was decades before the Full Moon Coffee House, the Country Store, or Deja Brew. Wendell Old, Wendell Old Home Day was like the only local gig. Um, there was no watering hall, hall where we could gather uh, to drink a beer or share stories with neighbors. Uh, the closest was Ma Alden's restaurant. In <laughs> oh, yeah. Right. Um, and uh, Walt's Club in Orange. But those folks really weren't accustomed to the long hairs. Um, so, uh, enter Greg Williams. Hey, come play in Warwick. Uh, I mean, it was right across the river, right up the hill, really like our sister village. And uh, you brought us up here, and I'm forever grateful, man. We had a great run here. Um, in the 70s, Warwick had a similar surge of resettlement by people of my generation. And uh, owner Bob Williams and son Greg welcomed all of us to the end, not just at the outdoor show that we began, but the bar had a little jukebox, a uh, pinball machine or two, and a stage and a dance floor. Uh, at that point, we were ready to rock. and. Uh, Summer of 74, I was wondering when the first gig was. I appreciate that. That's great to know. In the next 10 years, we play, played roughly 60 nights there. Wow. Um, always a great time. Our band archivist, uh, lead guitarist Johnny Moses, has yet to break out the actual books, but we, we can probably document most of those. But the place always offered a warm vibe, a cold beer, a full dance floor, and never a dull moment. <laughs> um, this is a, a reprint from the North County Advocate in October 28, 1981. Circulation 21,000. I, I can't know if this was an Athol Daily News sort of miniature paper or the Valley Advocate or whatnot. But <clears throat> the article is called Family Night at the Warwick Inn. Um, I'll just read some experts from it. Uh, a guy named Ernest King says, uh, who wrote the article, he says, believe me, you have to want to go to Warwick to get there. <laughs> <laughs> Arriving at the inn uh, and glancing at the crowded parking lot, I thought, oh no, another small club with wall-to-wall -wall people and overly loud music. Once through the door, however, I realized I was at a party. It was an actual family event. Mom, Dad, and the kids out for a night of boogie. About 250 people were there, and the atmosphere was so laid back, I had a hard time getting myself in gear to practice my craft of reporting. Um, that was like just so typical of, of what people's first reaction was coming to the inn. Uh, my attorney, Dave Singer, recently retired, was a student at a law school down in Springfield, and a friend of his said, hey man, we're gonna go for a ride, gotta see this band up in Warwick, Mass. And David was like, wow, really? Cool, fine. He gets in the back of this car, I think it was February. <laughs> and he, he tells this story, he says, yeah, we, were, we went up this highway, it was 91, we like went east towards Boston, and then there's like no street lights, there's no paint on the road, so I'm like, where am I going? This is nuts. And he had such a great time there that when he was back in New Jersey after getting his law degree, he said, I'm going to go back to Warwick and practice. You know, that's what brought him back up here 40 years ago. Klondike, did you know that David bought a house and lived in Warwick? I, I knew he'd, yeah, I knew he'd lived in, in Franklin County a number of spots. But that's he bought great. the chicken coop for Maggie and me <laughs> oh, <laughs> and lived there briefly, but uh, the chicken yeah, he lived in town. <laughs> 
So quickly, just some memories to sort of sprinkle through the uh, years. That's where uh, <laughs> Kai and Nadia live right now, just to let folks know. Wow. It was in the chicken coop, that's what it's called. The house right there, the yeah. blue one. Yeah. The blue. Yeah. Who still knows that house, or who knows that house has the chicken coop? Oh, I remember Throw that. Hands? Yeah. Mm. <laughs> Okay, I mean, there's a whole story there, and it's certainly entertaining, but we won't get to that today. But it is literal. Yeah, yeah. yeah. in a variety of ways, <clears throat> and it's a wonderful story, so maybe. Honda, back to you. Yeah, no worries. Uh, so yeah, at one point I did an uh, interview and mentioned the Warwick Inn. Uh, I'm basically, the quote here is that we could easily double the legal capacity of the place, and it was always a great time. <laughs> um, so my memories, uh, I'll start with uh, uh, Charles Smith, who would basically grab a quart of Valentine ale and start twirling in the middle of the dance floor. And he never fell down because the dance floor was so packed. People always <laughs> uh, Kids hustling parents for quarters for the pinball machines. Like snaking through the dancers. I need money, I need money. <laughs> uh, windows wide open, even in winter with people sneaking in or climbing out to get stoned. Uh, blistering harmonica solos by Michael Humphreys in a prom dress. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, unbridled renditions of Johnny B. Good by Greg Williams having leapt over the bar. <laughs> a Greenfield motorcycle gang that rode up in the middle of winter. <laughs> wow. Uh, plenty of encores and never a visit from the town cop. Was there one? George? <laughs> Did you ever come to the Warwick Inn, bust uh, us for yes, late nights? Yeah. <laughs> I can't remember if it was ever for this. Uh, um, uh, rock music type of thing. Right. <laughs> I, I, I can recall one time that, you know, the roof home, we had roof home. Didn't have 911 in those days. It was a big to do at the end. And uh, Bob Coker was one of the other officers, and him and I were going to come there and try to quell it. And I arrived, and I was waiting for him, waiting for him, and I could hear all the commotion inside. So I was about ready to go in by myself, and a state cop came around the corner. He had been up to the prison camp. And he came around the corner, and I flagged him down, and I felt pretty brave walking. <laughs> but I can't remember if it was if it was during this uh, rock band era or yeah. some other. I think that may have been a little bit before, because I can actually remember having been on the police department here in town, yeah. that it was often asked if they could put Steve on because the Outer Space Band was coming. <laughs> and I was sometimes referred to, there was WKNE, which closed, went off the air, out of King. And I can remember Chris Ryan and I were working on a project and we heard some comment about, yeah, the Outer Space Band is playing and I think they're getting the hippie cop. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> and that was that. But I, I will it. just say that um, the agreement that I had with the guy behind the bar, Greg, was, Greg said, I'm basically going to take care of the inside of what goes on here. And I've got to say, with Outer Space and Blue Caboose and a lot of those groups, things were really So it well. probably was before... I think so. Yeah, because yeah. there was a time for a couple of years when the selectman made a requirement that a police officer had to be on duty. Mm -hmm. And I got that gig, you know, every third week or so. Yeah. We all took turns. But most of the time, we would just sit in the parlor out front, mm -hmm. and uh, occasionally we might wander out to the dance floor so that everybody there knew that there was an officer on duty. But that was probably before the rock band. Yeah. But I think that same sort probably of Probably the country music uh, folks, they like to brawl. Um, yeah. Certainly <laughs> while I was there, Bobby basically we have to have an officer on duty, and the job was basically to be present in the parking lot, so when people came in, oh yeah, there's a police presence here, occasionally walk into the bar, but I went in very, very seldom, and I think 
some of the other guys, same thing. There was not a lot of time, and we didn't have to. Um, I think there were a couple of nights when someone just had too much to drink, and our role would be to help bundle whoever that was into a car so his wife could drive him home. Uh, you remember the night when he stabbed I, I, I'm not going to go there, but that's where I was going. Uh, so. Anyway, Klondike. Yeah, that, I'm, I'm pretty much done. I just want to uh, remember Charles, uh, Charles Smith for incredible poster work with his artwork. And uh, they're out there somewhere. I couldn't find one. Um, there are cassette tapes everywhere. I'm proud to say that uh, here we are talking about 50 years ago and the Outer Space Band is still alive and well. Um, we uh, played a big show at the Shea Theater in November. We've mm -hmm. got shows scheduled in Maine. In, in July and August, um, and uh, you know, the Warwick Inn was a, a serious part of our time in Franklin County. Uh, I still live here, and uh, I'm very grateful to uh, have those opportunities to play at your club, man. It was really a blast. Um, I'd like to say thanks for Ivan for hosting tonight, and to Wooden Fender for keeping the vibe alive here in town. Yeah. Greg, I'm going to just move on here. I know we've got with with sort of the next the next move for the end. I just want to throw in one thing that the larger the crowd, the easier it was to handle. That's what was funny about it, you know, and especially cool. we were able to serve kids because we had a, um, a, a, a food a food license also. So um, I used to always have a problem with the Winchester boys or the Swansea boys. Uh, I would shudder when they'd come through, but luckily my father got along with them, but uh, They'd, they'd go in the pool room, then all of a sudden these kids would come in and start playing, and they're just overwhelmed that there were kids here, and I never had any problems. The bigger the crowd, the easier it was to handle. Yeah. That's, uh, that's, uh, so, Greg, who did you and your dad sell the inn to after you, after the inn under your... Lisa and her significant other, yeah, in 1986, yeah. Okay. Robert Watson? Yeah. Yes. Lisa and Robert Watson. Yep. Yeah. And then why don't you take it from there, George? Just up to Lisa. I've got Lisa's uh, little uh, mm -hmm. notes. and work. Okay. And uh, Lisa bought the property from from whom? She Charles bought Williams. Him. Great. Okay. She, yeah. She okay. bought on bought share, so she owns the whole thing now herself. Correct. And Ivan? So Lisa couldn't be here today, but she was kind enough to uh, make some notes, uh, which I'm going to read, and hopefully it doesn't take more than you know three minutes or so. Right, so Lisa uh, became owner of what she refers to as uh, sort of the Warwick Tavern, Warwick Inn, Warwick Tavern, uh, and uh, we have that as being uh, in her ownership uh, with Robert Watson from 85 to 89. And uh, so here's what, uh, here's what Lisa had to say. She also sent a bunch of photographs uh, which are going to be included when we edit the, uh, the video of this presentation. Also, before I forget, uh, several of our guests, panelists, brought some things, uh, some uh, photos and stuff. So after we're done, take a look at some of the photos over there. We're going we're gonna to get some of those into the, you know, the final video cut. Um, Hope everyone has seen uh, the Outer Space Band uh, poster that's uh, over there on the right from 1982. And uh, also, I just have to say, among many remarkable things I've heard today, that this conversation went from talking about uh, destroying a piano in 30 minutes and moving it through a keyhole <laughs> to having world-class classical piano performances at the town hall. That conversation took place over like one minute. And I have to say, that's just awfully darn impressive among many other things that I've heard that are really darn impressive. So here's what Lisa's got to say. Purchased in 1985 and closed for one year for renovations with help from many Warwick contractors, a Warwick sawmill, and even some of the residents of the prison camp. Grand opening party was July 86 with a performance by the Grace Notes a barbershop quartet including Warwick's own Dana Tandy and Tim Cornwell, followed by Dr. G's Good Medicine Band with Matt Hickler and family. The first event held in the dance hall that summer was the PVRS 10th year high school reunion for the class of 76, and shortly after that a wedding reception for Andrea Minor and Dale Woods. 
They arrived from the church in a horse-drawn buggy. The Unitarian Church on the Hill was struck by lightning the night before their wedding, but that's a story for another time. <laughs> More events in the dance hall followed. Craft shows, musical performances, and brunches with guest speakers. Programs for old home days and many private parties. And each spring we were visited by the Morris dancers making their rounds. The tavern fell into a comfortable schedule. Darts were a thing on Thursdays and Friday nights were all about live music. Saturday nights were reserved for theme parties such as Pirate Night with costumes and a western themed dance party in the backyard under the stars. Halloween parties were a blast with the most creative costumes. On one such Halloween night, a gorilla in a police uniform walked in and the room went silent. It turns out it was a real Warwick Constable on patrol, David Ray, and he just stopped in to mess with us. The tavern could also be rented for private parties. One time it was rented for a wedding, Halloween themed, with the bride dressed as Elvira. Out of towners, what can I say? The Friday night music became the focal point and the heart of the Warwick Inn. In fact, there were some nights that the musicians outnumbered the audience. All manner of music, mostly acoustic, and many different instruments would drop in. Guitars, banjos, squeeze box, harp, harmonica, dulcimers, washboard, sax, trombone, trombone, flute, piano. I've probably forgotten some. My apologies. A community was formed, friends for 37 years now, and some of those folks moved to Warwick and made it their home through connections made at the inn. The tavern closed about 10 years later. Thank you, Lisa. So, yeah. Jim? <laughs> so, I, I came to town. I missed the Greg era of the inn. And uh, Lisa bought the inn, and it's my understanding there was a period of changing the culture that, that had its own lumps and bumps. But by the time I came, into, came to town, um, the end, I think, settle on a groove. It's it's accurate to say I music brought me to Warwick. Um, I was living in Wendell, uh, working in Keene. Uh, life, the, my cards in life got thrown into the air and were tumbling down. I was, I was came to town looking for a cabin, a little cabin in the woods somewhere, the kind of place that you you'd find by by word of mouth by bulletin board. I, there's a bulletin board at the store. There's a store. Well, I didn't know that the store was not. Uh, I found the bulletin board empty and wandered across the street to this Warwick Inn where Carrie Fellows was opening. And uh, she said, they're open only Thursday, Friday. But she said, you should come back by Friday night. There's music. Well, it doesn't, didn't take much persuading. I showed up the next <laughs> night and uh, this fellow, Jay Kloss, was banging on the piano. I ended up in the back room where I happened to know several people playing pool. I knew Howard, I knew Ronnie DeHart back there, and, um, and Lester was there, I met him. So come 10 o'clock, Jay stops playing, Lester picks up a guitar, Jay picks up guitar, I get on a piano. Next thing I know, it's like 1.30 in the morning, and I know everybody in the joint by now, and I still haven't done the glad handing around looking for a place that, that um, uh, that was my intention, but I was turned on, and everybody I knew back in Warwick was hearing all about what a cool place. I started coming up, um, quickly met, this is a difficult thing, quickly, quickly met Matt Hickler, he's a gregarious fellow, as you know, and I uh, started coming up to play with Matt and Jan Norris uh, a little bit in town. I'm getting more and more hooked on this thing. One of the nights that came up was um, Matt and Sam Hickler and their family band, Dr. G's Good Medicine, was playing. And one of the indelible memories of many, and this is kind of fun, as you talked about what a, what a place there was for kids in the end, was the three-year-old Jensie Rovang dancing in front of the band when I showed up at 8.30. When the band took a break, Dave Gill, the front man, ended up over at the piano playing claw hammer banjo, banjo with Lynn Manring. Jensie went over there and danced the whole time. Second set, she went over. And she danced from 8.30 to 11.30 at night. A place where a three-year-old can be and dance all night. I love this, you know. So um, Sue and I got together. We ended up moving up to town. And 
It was a regular. Thursday and Friday nights was when they were open. Thursday was darts. Friday was music. Um, darts. One night, one night we walked down. We lived at Dave Young's house at the old end of old, old Winchester Road. One night we walked down with their dog, and the dog hung out. So, so that was that was that. It got to be that we would go down to the inn on Friday night, and somebody would say, "Sam's outside." The dog knew where we'd be on Friday night, would walk down from the New Hampshire border and found us here. <laughs> so accurately, successfully. Um, so it's hard to, you can't communicate what, what magic you have, but I would like to list names, you know. Uh, folks, Jay Kloster was, was central, Lester, Ronnie DeHart, uh, Dr. G's Good Medicine, Sam Hickler and Matt Hickler playing uh, just brilliant jug band music uh, with harmonies. The force of nature that is Bob Doucette. If mm -hmm. anybody heard mm -hmm. Bob play, he... Um, Ghost Riders in the Wind. Yeah, Ghost Riders in the Sky and the Man on the Flying Trapeze. I remember going home, I was renting a house from a woman in, in Wendell and coming home knocked out saying, you know, talking about the amazing version of Man on the Flying Trapeze and how Ghost Riders in the Sky just shook the room so strongly it was scary. She looked at me like, Ghost yeah. Riders in the Sky? Yeah. And like, it's like, yeah, right? You know, it was just just uh, stunning stuff. Jim, were you there when the band, um, are you going to get to that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Miller's River Band, Annie Reed and Terry Reed, and Gina Larica and Tom Jordan spun magic there. Jeff Wallace, who lived there, um, he and Matt and Lester and Rob Anderson and I uh, formed a little band out of out of the scene here, and occasionally we would do an across the street tour and play at the town hall as well, and, and <laughs> place around the area. Um, the Boys of the Landfill. Uh, the Boys of the Landfill is kind of a grassy band out of out of um, blue grassy band out of uh, the Valley Folky. I actually I actually um, had made a comment that night. I can't remember what kind of banter was going on, but I said something. Oh, you're going to do the Madonna thing? Play the second set without clothes or something like that. Just some off the cuff. Uh, comment. I actually split. I had to go for or chose to go. I missed this. They took a break and I took the opportunity to go home. But they took the prompt and came back in with burdock leaves and nothing else but guitars <laughs> and, and played, played a, a memorable set um, <laughs> in costume. Um, they were also central to the Morris dancer, dancing scene that, that um, it would Lester that would take place here. Michael Humphrey's blown heart. And you know, the end went on for a while and then it ended. And um, various gatherings and, and local houses tried to and and later on at the Copper Angel tried to maintain the community that, that formed there. But um, for me it's what brought me to town and has formed the community that is uh, that's continued to light my light me up in this town. I would like to say, just listing names, um, mentioned Ralph. Since he in close, I'd just like to uh, mention other musicians who've come to town who who've been really significant to the to what the scene I know in town. I I hope I don't miss anybody really significant. I welcome anybody else to to uh, add to this list. Um, I'm on another page. Well, Dana, Dana, Dana Tandy is, and his whole family have been really significant to the music mm. scene. There was one night at the town hall that uh, Amy Tandy played her college, she's a reed player, clarinet player, she played her college recital piece on clarinet in the town hall and just flattened the room. It was brilliantly technical and musical. Uh, Tim Cornwall had the barbershop quartet would perform here regularly. State line. Yep. Um, Lynn Manring is, uh, is a, a traditional fiddle player who was central to the, um, brought an act that was central to the 250th anniversary dance that we had here. 
Um, since I moved to town, there's a fellow named Gary James who's out of Mississippi, a really fine uh, country blues player, and ran open mic on Town Hall for a while. Eric Engman is a pro bass who's graced our sages a few times. Phil Simon runs a real significant uh, music business, books, acts all up and down the East Coast out of his home in Warwick and the uh, OIC. Michael Italia came to town. Ivan plays drums. Michael plays guitar. Gordon Ellis came to town and really, really, um, mm. he might have been here longer than I knew him, but by the once I got to know him, really got to appreciate the music that he brought. He's also very significant at, at the church and music. Jenny Burtis came to town and, and spins real magic. Um, oh, other notes. One thing that was missed, there was a square dance scene. Uh, this is off, separate from the end. When we came to town, there was still a square dance scene, maybe the vestiges of what used to be a square dance circuit in the town halls. Sue and I used to go up and naively mess up the squares of the people who really knew how to do it. But um, <laughs> they were very tolerant. Most of them were very tolerant. Uh, Oliver and Jenny were always deeply in that. We did uh, ballroom dancing lessons in the town. Yeah. With a woman from Orange. So yeah. Blues Night. Blues Night started before I was here. Uh, Michael, I'm sure, was up to his neck. Jeff Wallace was up to his neck in it. I don't know if you were a part of the start of that, Alan. Um, but it was a it was a February February dance cabin fever night. Um, when then when Jeff died in a car crash, an organization was formed in his memory that was dedicated to promoting music in town. That's Wooden Fender. It's an offshoot of the Arts Council, and um, one of its first uh, actions. I wasn't on the committee yet. Um, was organizing um, the uh, sound improvements and purchasing a PA for the town hall in consultation with Clonda Kayla here uh, that have been really, um, pardon me, but instrumental in, in yeah. uh, uh, <laughs> the town hall, you know. You have a sound the sound Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah it's, it's Bass traps. Tremendous. Um, but since then, Wooden Fender has uh, kind of settled into a routine for a while. It was a little broader. We do a young musicians showcase. It was very cool, and a bunch of really fine young musicians uh, were presented to the stage. It's settled into a groove of, of pretty much being dancers. And I will say, musicians love playing here because people. Dance like crazy. Dance. People eat them up, and, um, and it's early, and the sounds good, and it's it, people really are positive about playing here. Rick King is, uh, played has played um, Blues Night a series of times, and is just a brilliant player in town. Rick and Tony. Watermelon Slim showed up, and he was more um, he was a significant musician. I didn't know that, but he showed up here and. Uh, had his guitar, um, he had a steel guitar, and uh, he played some music, it was, it was pretty cool. Just to see a guy come in off the street kind mm -hmm. of thing. So just just listing a few more names to, to finish up. Folks at Top Piano in town, Sherry Rabardis and uh, Alain Seacroft, in my time here, I'm sure there are other people who were significant in that role before, before my time. Um, the old home days stage. Gary James ran that for a while. I've gotten to run that for a few few years. It's an opportunity to, to bring performers to in front of people. One thing I was involved in that's a really sweet memory is we had COVID and everything shut down. And then this thing came together. It was um, the 80th birthday of one Bob Dylan. And we put together an event on the Common and had a bunch of musicians up there. And people came out, it was, it was right, it was before Omicron, it was right when we thought it was over. And, you know, uh, after being holed up, I think we had over 80 people on the common in a 700 person town that day. It was a gorgeous spring day. It was just, you know, it's the kind of thing, it's the kind of thing that we do well in this town, I think. 
Um, that's kind of it. Uh, there, there are music musicians at the church, which other people could speak well, speak further of, but I'd like to mention Nancy, Nancy Hickler, and uh, Ralph and Gordon Ellis, and Dana Tandy, Andrew Clara Woods. Thompson, Andrew and Amy Woods. Woods. Yep. So. Line. 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 There, so, and I'm sure there are a lot of a lot of um, strong, strong musicians throughout town that that don't bring it out as frequently, or or that are well before my time. That I welcome other people saying their names. Jan, I mentioned Jan earlier. George Rofe. George Rofe, yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of my my rundown, and and I talk for a long time. I'm sure mm -hmm. other people have things to pitch in around some of those memories. Well, I think everyone looks kind of like you had a pretty full afternoon. Mm -hmm. um, as I said at the outset, I'm sure we have missed a number of things, um, and maybe we can do more on this particular topic. Um, I'm going to. Say again, Ivan and myself and the rest of the, the panel, if any of you guys have any sort of ideas. Do you have an idea, Alan Morgan? <laughs> so near the end, I just want to say there was something that, that all this adds up to for me that was uh, at the Wooden Fender event, one of the last two right before COVID. Uh, about an hour into the program, the lead person at the band at the microphone looked out at the room of, of Warwick people, and he said, I think I'm in Brigadoon. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how many of you know what Brigadoon is. It's a story of a mythical Scottish village that appears once every 100 years, and everybody's happy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's about the towns. <laughs> and he just, you know, I think most of the people in the room missed him saying that. But for me, that kind of sums up everything we've heard today. The love of music, the community, the participation of all the people coming out of the woodwork in the middle of winter and just having an iron good time together and then going home. Mm -hmm. uh, well like, said. That's well really magical here sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The only thing I think that could possibly be added to that is, again, a reminder of the, the visuals to look at over there, including a shot of one of the bed races teams from 1987 <laughs> with a David Young without facial hair. Don't miss it. <laughs> and if people can identify some of the other people uh, on board. I think Jeff Wallace is there, and there are two other, maybe David McAuliffe. I don't know who's actually riding the bed, but if anybody can identify And Greg them, bought, brought several notebooks of his that are up there for uh, for viewing as well. Steve. Yeah, I just There's want to mention something. Um, that, uh, earlier we alluded to the fact about uh, theater continuing thinking about entertainment in the future. And so there will be a sign-up sheet going along, and just to, and just to let you know how, how lucky you could be if you sign up for this. And I'll tell you my little story, which will be very short. But there is one man in this room who has given me an opportunity to wear a dress on stage. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> as lovely as I am, when you entertain yes. experience, you can experience that. It's a blast. <laughs> We've got dresses in all sizes. <laughs> Have a hand for our panelists and our audience. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. This was fun. <laughs>